Good morning, SBCA. Welcome to our Sunday worship. We're so glad that you've decided to worship with us virtually today uh, as we go through this intense summer heat wave. Uh, wherever you are, I hope you're staying cool. Uh, we're here recording at church. The AC is not working, so if you see us starting to sweat uh, during the middle of the service, we're right there with you. Um, you know, we've been sharing uh, in our small groups just about how we're doing on a week-to-week -week basis, and this past Friday, many people were sharing about some of the struggles that they've been having as they go through this prolonged shelter in place and dealing with a pandemic and just all the challenges that come from everyday life, like working from home and kids in school and family members getting sick. And so I hope that as we come to worship God this morning, that we are reminded once again how deeply God loves us, that he has plans to bless us and to prosper us, that he is watching over us. And wherever you are at your home right now, that you believe with assurance and faith in your heart that God loves you. And so as we sing this song uh, that we've taught two weeks ago, uh, let's sing this together as a church in faith, that God truly loves us, that he is blessing us and watching over us. to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing that one more time with assurance. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Sing it out.
are so thankful to you this morning. Lord God, we just lift our hands and praise and worship as we declare, God, that you are for us. And Lord, that you stand for us, Lord Jesus, that you have died and you have already overcome the world so we can take heart. Lord, we know that we stand in a place of blessing today. We know that we stand as your beloved and as your redeemed. And so, God, we give you praise. Lord, no matter what circumstance we're going through, no matter the shadows or the valleys, Lord, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. time to Pastor Johnson. Good morning. This Sunday morning, we are continuing the book of Acts. Last time we get together, we saw Paul in the Areopagus, Mars Hill, talking to the philosophers of his day, dealing with the idols all around the city, encamping the place, covering it like a jungle. And today, we're going to get more into the details. It's not just the idols, the power behind the idols. Power behind the idols is really the spiritual power, the power of darkness. And we see Paul as he brings the gospel and he brings God with him. He brings light into the darkness. And this is what we have to face. That when we talk about social upheaval, it's not just the simply the changing of a system outwardly. It's a changing of unseen systems and powers. It is a power encounter. In chapter 19 here, there's... 
two years have gone by. We're, we're not covering chapter 18, but between 17 and 19, you have two years that have passed. Paul has been ministering in Corinth for two years, another incredible city, a port city. And of course, there's books written to the Corinthians, four letters in all, two that we have in, in scriptures. And he leaves Apollos there, which we discover is a very good orator, defender of the faith. So he feels that Corinth is in good hands. He's, he's now able then to move on to his next missionary spot, which happens to be Ephesus. And that's where we pick up the story today. Ephesus, where he's going to spend most, more time than any other city in his, in his ministry. And he's going to encounter spiritual powers there. It is a power encounter. We're talking about spiritual warfare. We're talking about how actually societies are changed. Not just surface changes, but true change. Because when you go after true change, you have to go after the spiritual powers of that area and what really binds those people. So let's continue. Number one on your handout is the gospel breaks into the powers of darkness in Ephesus in the first 10 verses. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for about three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. That's an incredible summary of two years of ministry in Ephesus. Now again, this is, we crawled that he had now passed through Corinth, leaving Apollos there, doing great ministry, entering into Ephesus. What does he find in Ephesus? Is he finds there are Jewish believers or so-called people who have been baptized under John, but they have never heard of Jesus or Jesus' baptism or the Holy Spirit. Essentially, what he finds are Old Testament people. These are people that are good, God-fearing Jews. They're still awaiting the Messiah. They're, they've never heard of the Holy Spirit, not at least in the New Testament sense of coming in power, residing permanently in the believers. So when he finds them, he begins preaching to them and telling them. And as he's doing, it's like a mini Pentecost. They believe the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they become believers. And they follow Paul and all of a sudden they say, yes, this is the fulfillment of my Jewish faith. That now I am truly in the Lord. That as we talked and followed after John and his water baptism, the one that came after him, as of course Paul is now preaching to him what Jesus said, is fulfilled because the lamb that was slain is slain for them. So, you could see here that in Paul's ministry, it's not just to the far off lands and the Gentiles and the people who are basically starting at nothing. He also, and his, his pattern, goes to the synagogue, speaking to the Jews of those that have a common heritage, a common understanding of the scriptures. Those that come into an understanding of what it is to be a good Jew, awaiting the Messiah to come. They were receptive. And so when he heard the news, they say, yes, this is what we've been waiting for. And we see here in the coming of the Holy Spirit, a breaking in, in this area of the power of darkness. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but it is a strong beginning that now God is here in this land and he's working in such a way that now is beginning to change minds and hearts. Now, this was very good for about three months, but not everybody believes. As he's talking in the synagogue, there are some hardened Jews 
They're like, no, I don't think we're going to follow this cult leader. We're not going to follow these false teachings. And others begin, as they get more and more familiar with Paul, they begin to get really more dug in, more stubborn. And there's, it signifies something. When all of a sudden they dug in, they say, no more of this. He says, okay, it's time to leave. And it's a pattern we see in Jesus' ministry. It's a pattern we see in Paul's ministry. They go to the receptive ones. But if there's resistance, they don't want to hear, he moves on. As Jesus says, you shake the dust off your sandals, keep going. Go to the receptive people. And that's what he does. And so the crowds are getting uh, pretty large too. So he takes his opportunity to rent out the Hall of Tyrannus, which I think is a hilarious title because Tyrannus means tyrant. So whether people call it, yeah, you know, that guy that owns it, he's a tyrant, or maybe he teaches there, that guy, you know, just like a teacher sometimes given uh, nicknames by their students. You know, that's the evil professor, or that's the real tough person. He was called the tyrant. Obviously, his name wasn't the tyrant, but it was a nickname given to him, and that's what it was called, the Hall of the Tyrant, the Hall of Tyrannus. And that's where he begins to move out of the synagogue into this area this of more of the public square area, very similar to Acts 17, where it was not just limited to Jews, but this was a common meeting place. So under perhaps shade, columns, indoor space, they can meet together and begin to discuss these things, perhaps over candlelight at night, and, we, and he does his ministry. Two years this continued, and he did this so thoroughly that it says that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jews and Greeks. Now, they mean this figuratively, that there's so many that came to him. And that there, there are people that put their faith in Christ because of his teaching. Here we see that he worked tirelessly. He actually um, taught and, and continued throughout. So he, he reasoned daily. And we're, we're, we're told that he continued to do this for two years. And you can add up the amount of hours, the amount of the thousands of hours and interactions that he had. Uh, he probably worked as a tent maker early in the morning, as legend would have us and as, as these things are passed down to us. He would work in the morning until around 11 in, in doing his tent making business to support him and to pay for many of these things. But from 11 to 4, he was there teaching and preaching. And so that was a, that was a strong five-hour day, six days a week, 30 hours a week. He would stand in this hall answering all questions, reasoning and persuading. So here I want you to see something really important. That as he came together reasoning and persuading, he really, uh, as we see in verse 8, he gives not just facts, for example, Jesus rose from the dead, but he persuades. He's able to say not only that Jesus rose from the dead, but this is important because it ties together with life and death issues. What you and I are dealing with today, what you are worrying about, Jesus is the answer for that. He per he's very persuasive. Why? Because he wants them to make a decision. He wants them to move from where they are and to put their trust and faith in Christ. This is very instructive to us. This is his pattern. He's not teaching for teaching's sake. He wants an action. And the action here is to put their faith in Christ. Not everybody is convinced, but many people were. So throughout all Asia, they began to come then because he's not moving. He's not an itinerant uh, moving uh, missionary at this point. He is the speaker at the hall of Tyrannus, the tyrant. And word gets out, hey, you got to hear this guy. He's saying something I think we need to hear that's fresh and new, that, that rings true and it's real. And we hear testimonies. And after a while, it's not just him, but he's, he's able to speak in such a way. So all of a sudden, they came to hear him. And I, I, I can imagine not only there was crowds that had formed, people waiting out, out, out the door, and his reputation preceded him. This is where you come to hear about uh, the Lord. And so much so that we could even say all of Asia, that is, you know, in such a way that they came to hear of the gospel. Well, 
this is wonderful and things are moving on. And he gets deeper into the spiritual encounters of this city as we see in this next section. Verses 1120, number two, the authority of Christ over mysticism and magic. Ephesus was a place that was known for its mysticism and magic. They had their magic cults, their amulets, their secret sayings, their gods and goddesses, and these incantations. And magic was very much a part of society in Ephesus. And so when he speaks, all of a sudden he's like, no, this is not magic. This is the real thing. I'm not trying to conjure up something, but there is a God that's over all this. Again, we see here a power encounter. Verses 11 to 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out to them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and empowered them, overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greek. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of us, those who were now believers, came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had banned, had practiced magic arts, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Wow. So very similar as we saw early on with the shadow of Peter even passing by. They had hoped that they, his shadow would touch them for healing. In this mystical magic place, they felt like anything that, that Paul touched was enough magically to, to have power, healing power. So they would try to catch his handkerchiefs or aprons or anything that he touched, napkins essentially, and hopefully this magic power would flow through him. There were obviously a lot of miracles that were happening. Again, an influence into this darkness that there were people being healed. Not all the uh, miracles are recorded, but enough so that there's a prominent understanding that Paul and what he's doing and the power that he has is enough to overcome physical illness and even cast out demons. So when he starts doing this, all of a sudden, the seven sons of this Jewish high priest, Sceva, says, I got an idea. It's like this magic incantation, just like anything else. It's like hocus pocus. This is the magic phrase. And the magic phrase was this, in the name of Jesus, I command you, right? And you can imagine that Paul used this because it is by the authority of Jesus. But, it, but they didn't understand. It wasn't the words. It really was the authority of Jesus working in and through Paul now that he can command because he is a son of God. He has a connection. But we see this a lot. We see this almost like uh, if you guys watched the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was the first one of the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. You know, the, the Nazis were going after the Ark. And why did they want to go after the Ark? Because it possessed this killer power. And they were warned, right? Don't do this because if you open this lid, it's not a power you can control. And of course, it's one of those fantastic scenes in cinema in that movie. When the lid is taken off, the power comes up and all the Nazis, got, you know, basically, they get ex- their heads are exploded. And it's a wild scene because God cannot be controlled. But there was still that understanding, although it's in the movie, that they can control the power of God. This is what was happening in Ephesus. All we need is a simple incantation. Say the magic words, and it's almost as if God has to do that your your bidding. If we can only know those magic words, and that's why they had all these books and magic books, because they, they numbered in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that was so expensive. They really believed that it was the magic and the power was in these words. Well, when these seven sons of a high priest who really should know better, 
got into magic and mysticism, uh, they, it did not come out the way they wanted. They invoked the name of Jesus. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. So they don't have any connection to Jesus. All they know is what Paul has been doing, but they want to take that. So it's in the name of the authority of this person that Paul has been proclaiming. Well, that doesn't do it in the, in the spiritual realm. This evil spirit, I mean, they run out of the house naked. Not only does the spirit not come out of that person, that, those spirits now, that spirit is now uh, moved to thrash these sons of Sceva so that they're in for a beating and rip clothes from them. So now they're naked, screaming and leaping out of the house. And this now became something also known in this world. Wow, don't mess around with this. If you don't know Jesus, you can't just go around having a magic incantation thinking everything's going to be fine. Now something happens that's really interesting right after this. After this, many people believed. Why? Because this is real. The power in Jesus is real. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have that power. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. And it was just confirmation to what Paul was saying all along. And so they began to believe. Again, this is a very mystical place, a very mag- people that believed in mysticism and magic. So when they saw true power, they said, that we, that's the real thing. All our lives we've been messing around with this kind of stuff. Here's the real thing. And so they said, yes, I, we come to God. But another curious thing started to happen. And that is this. That those people that were already believers following Paul saw what was happened, were convicted. Why? They had grown up here in Ephesus. This is their home. They grew up around mysticism and magic. They grew up with the incantations. And they had a few volumes at home. These scrolls, these magic spells, these secret words. And so here they were claiming to be a believer, and they are believers, and the Bible tells us they're believers, and yet there's a part of them that that's not fully sanctified yet. They're still holding on to the incantations in the old life, and all of a sudden they're convicted. Wow. God is real. What are we even doing, dabbling in mysticism and magic? What are we trying to do, trying to control God with our little sayings? And they say, you know what? I know what we're going to do. We're going to bring all of these books, who are, which are really valuable, these scrolls, super valuable. And we're going to bring it um, before, uh, before Paul, and we're just simply going to burn them. 50,000 drachmas is a, of silver is equivalent to 150 people's working wages, I mean, in a year. I mean, it's a lot of money. It's a ton of money. And a lot of people could say, very similar to what maybe Judas would say, uh, when, when precious perfume was broken and given to Jesus. Why can we just sell this stuff? So we use the money to fund ministry. I mean, poor Paul, he's just making tents by himself. Can you imagine the amount of money we can get from this? They don't even give that a second thought because those books are worthless spiritually. So he says, you know, we're going to burn them. And so they gather the books together and they're worth 50,000 pieces of silver, a hefty sum, and they burn them. But what it's telling to us about this is these were not homes in the unbelievers or found in the street corner. This was, these were found in the homes of believers. And so this challenges us today. We may be believers, and yet we may be dabbling in the occult. And perhaps that was something that we were even familiar with or uh, did a lot when we, before we came to Christ. But we got to get rid of that stuff. Now you're saying, oh boy, I don't think I dabble with the occult or the dark arts or those kind of things. Let me just name a few things. And by the way, let me just say this. I love bookstores and not everything's closed these days. Barnes and Nobles, by the way, is open. You walk into a Barnes and Nobles today and you will see the occult section many, many times larger than the Christian section. I've actually even gone over to that section and see and just say, who actually comes? A lot of them are young girls. A lot of them are people just curious because they've read about something. All of a sudden, it's, a cool, it's cool to read about white magic or good magic. And, and, and what, what is it about? And all of a sudden, they, they find out all the stuff about witchcraft. 
But it's not, even, it's, 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 it, it's not always that blatant. It could be very subtle. For example, a lot of people, just for fun, get up every morning and read their horoscope. And they think, oh, it's not a thing. It's just fun. But the thing is, all of a sudden, that little fun thing begins to have some power and authority over you. Again, we're talking about spiritual powers of darkness. So it could be something as innocent as a horoscope. I see this sometimes on Facebook where people will, will do certain things about, hey, your, your, your birth, you know, what month you were born, your astrological sign, what does this all mean? This is a good month for you. This is a bad week for you. This is your worst day. This is your best day, whatever. All that stuff is tied up in this type of thing. And so what happens is when we have that kind of stuff and we're tied to that, there's a power that's unseen, a spiritual power that's still over us. And the believers here in Ephesus immediately recognized power. And they understood that now after this uh, incident with the seven sons of Sceva, we can't have this in our lives. We've got to get rid of this. And they come clean and they confess. And it is a glorious time. Paul doesn't do an altar call. He doesn't need to. It speaks for themselves what has happened. And they come and they fall before Paul. Oh, God, have mercy on us. What are we going to do? Well, let's burn it. And they have a glorious burning. Because he, these were evil and it, and, it, and it signified the power it had over their lives. And now they were free to follow Jesus. The true authority. And not to be bogged down with the occult. I got to tell you today, whether you're looking at TV shows, movies, books, online, horoscopes. You, we ha, we are, our country right now is rampant in the occult. Uh, you, it's, it's, it's sad because in many places you can't speak about Christ and his authority. But you talk about Wicca, you talk about witchcraft, you're welcome. Now all of a sudden they're curious. Don't be fooled. The spiritual battle is very real in your life and mine in America today. And we got to stand firm. And we got to get rid of stuff. So when God begins to reveal stuff to you, you just, number one, it's very simple. You don't have to dwell too much on it. You just either got to stop the practice. Stop looking at your horoscopes. Um, get rid of books that start talking about good witchcraft, bad witchcraft. Definitely, if you have a Ouija board, which is still made by Milton Bradley for kids, by the way, ages 10 and up, that's what it says on it. You got to get rid of that thing. Because the, th the crazy thing about a Ouija board, it, it's promoted as a game, is it, it really works. And that's the appeal for a lot of kids and overnight parties and everything else. But behind it is spiritual power and there is bondage. You got to get rid of it. So these spiritual powers that come, um, the, it's described, these aren't just mere miracle, uh, mere magical tricks. When Paul begins to heal with handkerchiefs and aprons, it is real power working in and through Paul. We, we see that he, the people understand they don't, this is not magic. This is something different. There's power and authority in it. All of a sudden, they, they, they see that the demon possessions that were going on. Demons are being kicked out. God is beginning to reign in this area and demons are being kicked out. And so they wanted to try it too. And that's what gets them into trouble. These seven sons of Sceva. Well, let's go on to number three. Overturning culture and idols in Ephesus. You know, our series is the Holy Spirit and social upheaval. There are layers. There are layers. In, in, in social upheaval, let's go back to, let's say, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There was a layer there. Because obviously, now we look back, we even celebrate that. We go, of course, of course, people of different colors, particularly if they're African American, should have the same rights as we have. Of course, right? At one level, now it's put in the legislation, the Civil Rights Act, you can't discriminate based on race. We say, of course, that's true. That's at the surface level. What's happening today with the riots and everything else is people just are trying to change hearts. And the problem is the human heart is deceitful above all things. Okay? But they are bringing out something. Is that what is now in 1964 stated as law doesn't mean it translates straight into the heart and soul of a person. So here in, in, in the United States, we have a surface legislation in the Civil Rights Act. 
And yet what they really want to do is heart change. That's what really people want. African Americans, what they want is respect and to be loved. Okay? All, uh, many Caucasians just say, hey, I, I don't want them to be overly favored. I just want a, 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 a level playing field as well. So this is what's going on in America. You have a surface change in the law, but in reality, it's the change of the heart that's going to bring about true change and, and unity. What Paul does here now is get at the heart of this city and of this culture. And if they can change the foundations of this city, of this culture, everything else will change. And this is why we see now the power and counters really begins to speed up here. Let's take a look. Number three, overturning culture and idols in Ephesus. Starting from verse 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. Uh, they weren't always known as Christians, just the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. Then he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowds, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had even come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand, wanting to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are opened and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when then he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Chapter 1 of verse 20. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And that ended his time there, two years and three months in Ephesus. He gathers together... This is quite a lengthy passage, but you can see what is happening. His teaching then is not now just only in the synagogue. He's moved to the tyrant hall or the hall of Tyrannus. And word is getting out. All of a sudden, the spiritual encounter that happens with the seven sons of Sceva has gotten out. And all of a sudden, it's seeped into the culture. The message is, hey, wait a minute. You're not just telling us about one God. We are very comfortable with a multitude of gods. But wait a minute, Paul, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying there's only one true God and therefore Ephesus, which is known as the place of the great goddess Artemis, or in Roman uh, goddess, she's Diana, is false. You're saying our goddess is false. Is that what you're saying, Paul? So they begin to put two and two together. 
But I got to tell you, it begins, their story is undermined by their true motivation. After the 50,000 drachmas of silver worth of books and scrolls are burned, all of a sudden there's this upheaval in society where people are moving toward God. And guess what? They're no longer visiting the Artemis store. They're no longer buying these little idols for their homes. They're losing business. So really, when you look down clearly, what's happening is it, now there's an economic reason. Now, this is a big deal. Now, before it was just nice. You can believe, you can hear Paul. Now it's really beginning to hit them in their pocketbooks. They're losing business. And so here, you, you do have a man, Demetrius, a silversmith, and he, he sees business plummet, maybe 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%. He goes, we're in trouble. Not only is Paul teaching heresies and lies, but now we're going to lose our livelihood. If this continues, we're going to have to close up shop. This is bad. Now again, for them, it's more economic because they say, you know, we're, we're always going to believe that kind of thing. But business is going down. And so this is tough. When he gathered the people together, they said, this Paul, he's causing trouble for us in our city. See, up until now, he was just a teacher, a religious teacher. Now he's messing with the fabric of our society, of who we are. Every good hallmark of a move of God, revival, uh, in, whether it's in our nation or around the world, is going to hit all areas of society. It's, it will never be just confined to a meeting room. If it's a true move of God, it's going to move outside of that room. It's going to move into families and in relationships and into the business world and into the marketplaces, into the streets. In the first and second awakenings here in the United States, they literally had to close down the bars because nobody went and got a drink. Okay? Police uh, uh, jails were emptied. So police officers were let, let go and they can go home early. This is type of the effect that they had on society. And this is the type of effect that Paul had in his ministry in Ephesus. People were literally leaving their idols. They were basically following God, beginning to live a sanctified life. And it caused problems for people like Demetrius, a person in the idol trade. Well, <clears throat> the commotion that's caused here gets the attention not only of those who are buying and selling idols, those who are, are that now you have a riot. Because Demetrius has gathered the people together and they are shouting. And again, this is not a discussion anymore. This is not like the hall of Tyrannus where people can raise their hands or say, Paul, please give your explanations of why Jesus is the son of God, the only true God, why we should turn from our idols. No, this was just outright riot. And what they're going to say is, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. That's all we know. That's the slogan that they're going to say. And they don't want to hear about, this is not about reason. And they're, 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 a riot is really underway. And it, and it gets the attention of the Asiarchs. It sounds just what it is. You bring out Asia and Arcs are rulers. Arche is the Greek word for rule or ruler. So you have the rulers of Asia in this province come together. And many of them are believers. And they're, they're telling Paul, Paul, look, you're going to have to get out of here because it's getting dangerous. In the last few months, we've seen riots. There have been peaceful demonstrations, but some of them have turned into outright riots. And in riots, that's not a good time for dialogue. Uh, you just got to get out of the way. People are coming and they're smashing store windows and they're grabbing stuff and, and you have this frenzy and it's, it's not a good time for reason. Uh, that's, reason doesn't reign during riots. And they're saying, Paul, we're in a riot type situation. What you've been doing with reasoning and bringing scripture, so there's going to be another time for that, but this is really dangerous. So at the same time all of this is happening, you, you, have, um, you have people who then are saying, look, Paul doesn't speak for all of us. So now the Jewish unbelievers want to push forward their own point of view. And so they bring forth, they want, they want Alexander to get uh, some stage time, and he gets shot down. Uh, basically. Again, not everybody, just because they're Jewish, supports Paul's position. Matter of fact, the, the hardened, stubborn old Jews are saying, no, 
Paul is teaching heresy. He is a cult leader and a follower, and we don't want anything to do with him. However, let us tr- tell you about the true God, okay? the, the God of the Jews. Okay? And so their spokesperson is Alexander. This, this comes to a, a head where they're shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Her statue is here, it's well known. This is the capital of, of, of the idol worship for, for Artemis. And the city clerk is called out and this pro council, he's more like a mayor of the city. And he says, look, we don't want trouble, but we are a Roman province. And if, we, if this word gets out and we're going to be charged with riotings, the Roman authorities are going to get in here basically... It makes him look bad. He can't control the city. But he really understands what is happening. You guys have to calm down. The courts are open. If he's done anything illegal, file a complaint. We'll put him on trial. But if you're just going to riot, I can't have you do that. So they come together. Uh, He was a person for crowd control. Uh, He also believed that Artemis was uh, a true goddess. Um, he, he did not want to say anything against the people. He was, just, he was supporting the people. But um, Demetrius and their colleagues and the, and the people that were making idols and selling idols, they had a case against them. But what was the wrongdoing? What could you say? How could you fault people for not buying stuff? So they're saying, I don't see anything wrong here. You can't charge people for not buying stuff from you anymore. So what is the real issue? What's happening? So the only thing that they can think of to charge Paul with anything is that you're you're starting a riot, even though he's not the one instigating this. So in this place, um, the proconsul here, um, they they decide we we can't hear this. We have to to begin to uh, shut this down. Okay, they want a reasoned exchange. And so finally, Paul begins to leave the area. That's how this thing begins to calm down. Now, this chapter uh, for us is fairly quick. I mean, we go through this chapter and it seems like it ends pretty, just like all the other chapters. It's almost three years, two years and three months. Scripture says it's three years. It's two years and three months of, of his ministry. Two years in Corinth in chapter 18. So nearly five years of ministry is covered in these two chapters in verses 18 and 19. Two of the most, uh, that's time he's ever spent. Second to the most in Corinth and the most is he spent in one, one place in ministry is Ephesus. No wonder we have a book to the Ephesians later. And no wonder that this becomes near and dear to his heart. And also, again, this, is, this will be covered again as one of the seven churches in, in, um, in Revelation. But you remember that in one of the seven churches of Revelation, it wasn't that they weren't faithful or they're bold. It's just that they had lost their first love. And that's what they had that God says I have against you. And so this is a strong church, one that God uh, used Paul to pour life and truth into in a spiritual and a power encounter. And what's happened in a very short time, you could look at history. Obviously, nobody today uh, seriously worships Artemis of the Ephesians. And in a very short time, you're going to see the gospel wins. This infiltration that we see at the beginning of the chapter, this light into darkness begins to break through the entire area where now light does shine and darkness is kicked out, just like the demons that were kicked out. Truth wins out. And in a very short while, you see the fall of the uh, Artemis cult or the Diana cult. And this is how God works. He begins to work in a city. He begins to work in such a place so that Hearts are changed. But what is this saying for us today? It's saying that even though we are believers, we have to be very careful that we don't hold on to occultic practices. That even though the syncretistic type of thing that happens in many, many cultures, we try to hold on to things that were before us, like, oh, it's just fun having horoscopes. Or what's so wrong about playing a Ouija board after a while? Or even, I know, when I was growing up, the big game that came out with Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. There's a lot of mysticism and magic in those type of games. The power isn't on the surface through the cards and the things and the dice and the figurines. No, it's the power behind that. And so that's the danger of the horoscope. Not that it's this fun little thing or the Ouija board. It's the power behind it. 
And it's the power behind the occultic practices that perhaps even as Christians today, we might still have, maybe even unknowingly. Pray for God to show you how you're giving an open door to God to work so that you have darkness working in you. And as believers here with Paul recognize, after the seven sons of Sceva incident, they came before him and they said, let's burn it. Let's burn it all. Don't even sell it for money. Let's burn it all. And let's dedicate ourselves fully to the Lord. Know that you and I are in a spiritual warfare. When we talk about social upheaval, again, there are the surface things like maybe an idol shop going out of business. But that's not the real deal. The real deal is the power of darkness is broken in that city. And that happens with the proclamation of the gospel. When God comes into a place and then his reign takes over an area. That's how it happens. And we see it powerfully here in Ephesus. And so it is in our country, as we see, as we mentioned in 64 with the Civil Rights Act, that was a surface. Of course, people are equal in the eyes of the government. Why should we treat one race better than the other? It's so obvious. That's in the surface. Today, we're still dealing with the underneath stuff. Are we truly in our hearts of hearts believing that all people are created equal. We should treat people equally and love people equally as God does. And so it is. It's not just the surface stuff, the closing of a few idol shops, the um, renting out of a hall, the tyrant's hall, but what's going on spiritually. Let's pray that God does that work. It's not just that it happened in Ephesus, but God desires to do that work in our hearts today. Let's pray. Father, we call on you as Lord and God. And many times, Lord, it might be that in several parts of our lives and compartments, Lord, we've given an invitation and room for the devil to work, for the powers of darkness to be in our lives. And we, we've dabbled in things, God, that seem so innocent, like fortune cookies and horoscopes, Ouija boards, psychics. Oh, just to see what job I'm going to get next or who I'm going to marry. Involved in other deeper things like maybe seances. Even innocent things like occultic type of games. Video games. So, and and there's, there's, it's in our society, it's so insidious, it's so much a fabric of our culture, just as it was in Ephesus. We might not have a, a tall 20, 30 statue of some woman that we call an idol, but there's other things in our society that behind it, the spiritual power of darkness works. God, working through our lives as believers, just as the believers here in Ephesus saw what happened after the seven sons of Sceva, threw down their very valuable scrolls, 150 working men's wages for an entire year, a tremendous amount of money, offered up, burned. And God, may we get rid of these things. And God, would you, by your power, show us, Lord, what are these things that's holding us back so we give them to you? We give authority back to you and you only. We pray, Father, for the United States, for our area, for California, for the Bay Area, that you use us, Lord, to be your servants in this process of social upheaval, For it's not just the surface stuff, but we're after the hearts and minds of people. Use us, Lord, and Spirit of God, go before us so we can see true change in ourselves and in those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnson, for that sermon. And as we come to this time of our weekly communion, uh, we are reminded that as, as Paul was journeying through Greece and through Asia, that his message to everyone, whether they were Gentiles or whether they were Jews, was it doesn't matter the, the, maybe the past that you've had, it doesn't matter the background that you have, that the gospel of Jesus Christ invites all to come to Jesus and to come and receive salvation and the forgiveness of sins. And so that same message rings true today as we are coming before this bread and this cup. I hope that we are reminded once again that we can come just as we are. It doesn't matter how you've lived this past week. It doesn't matter if you've um, you know, felt far from God or if you feel challenged, uh, that, that the table beckons us to come t- to, to once again receive the precious love of Jesus Christ and his, and his salvation that is freely given for all of us. And so let's come together during this time of communion and just remember him.
Father's love calls us, and Christ is risen, conquering over sin and death. He's done it. He's broken our chains. He's set us free. And as we come before him, all that we, he has for us is available for us. At the table, we come. You come, and you've said yes to Jesus Christ. You've had the Holy Spirit come into your life. You've been baptized in his name. And just like the Ephesian church, you want to say yes, and you're saying yes to God and to Christ. But there may be other things that you're saying yes to too. Perhaps God is bringing to your right mind right now. You need to set those aside because those things are not compatible. They fight against God. They're holding you back. It could be as simple as fear. It could be as simple as something that was so comfortable to you growing up with, a security blanket. Or it could be as something as insidious as uh, occult practices. But whatever it is, you're free from it. You don't have to be enslaved to it any longer. God has freed you from it. Say no. Set those things aside. Give your lordship completely back to the Lord Jesus Christ. He reigns over it all. I invite you now to come to the table as you gather the elements together, break of the bread, Remember the costly price of Christ, his life given for you. He knew exactly what you're going through. He knows what you're going through right now. He died for that. He died for bringing you back to him as a son, as a daughter, to give you fullness of life, abundant life. And so we rejoice because the victory is ours in Christ. Let's take together. cost Christ his life. His blood was shed for us, pouring out of his body, the Lord covering over our sins so that we are clean, white as snow before Christ, before God. We praise the Lord. You're not defined by your past and all your mistakes and your feelings and your wrongs and sins. But you're defined by who you are and the calling of the future God has for you. The hope he has for you for today and for a bright future with him forevermore. Let's take together. Praise you, God, for true salvation. But we are alive in you, fully alive given our lives to you. You've died for our sins, for all of our wrongs. And in, our, in its place, you filled us with your spirit, with hope and of joy, of purpose, with new life. I praise you, Father. We're never alone. You're always with us. I praise you, God, for giving us the family of God, for your spirit. I God, all our days, you walk with us. May we walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you again for worshiping with us together as one family. We just have a couple of announcements headed your way. The first is that SVC is having its annual Labor Day conference on September 4th through 6th. More information will follow, but we will, this will be the first time that we're having our annual Labor Day conference online. We also have weekly prayer meetings every Sunday morning at 9, 10 a.m., as well as every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. You can find the Zoom link on our website, svcae.cc. One more thing, we also have small group uh, fellowship that happens every Friday, either uh, started on uh, 8, 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Uh, so uh, please go to our website again to find all of the links. And if you are interested in knowing no more about our church, uh, you can reach out to Pastor Johnson. You can also find his contact on the, on the website. 